Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for attending or coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Ndlov Wiseman. As uh, Johan has already introduced, I'm based at the Stellenbosch University uh, with the African Wildlife Economy Institute. And welcome to my talk. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with you uh, uh, a research study, which is primarily based on literature, looking at the data from the rest of the African continent. We're looking at uh, going back into nature or unlocking nature, but in this at this stage, going into the wild meat. Why should we consume wild meat? Why should we talk about wild meat as part of unlocking nature or as part of the sustainability strategies that uh, um, we, we seek to achieve in the landscapes? So I am a postdoctoral uh, research fellow with the Institute. So this is going to be my talk today. Um, uh, my... Uh, presentation seems to be a bit slow. The PowerPoint. Wiseman, if it's not moving forward, at the bottom left corner, um, there should be some arrows there that you can click and that should move it forward. All right, if you have any other suggestions, okay, please. Um, there we go. You're on. Okay. Seems to be moving now. Thank you. Uh, you so this is going to be the outline of my discussion today of my talk. I'm going to look at why the wild meat and what is the focus for the discussion today. And I'm also going to give more on the results of what we find in terms of specific uh, species that are consumed or that are utilized across the African continent in different regions, uh, which ones are common, which ones are utilized. And we're also going to look at the value chains, both the, the legal value chains and also the illegal value chains. And we're also going to look at how can these value chains be developed and what are their challenges and what could be the possible outcomes for commercializing uh, these uh, wildlife or wild meat value chains. So we'll look into that and also, also delve into the legal and policy environment and also talking about the future of the wild meat sector. Uh, so the question always... Uh, arises is why do we talk about the wild meat and the title of the discussion today is uh, the wild meat in the kitchen the question uh, certainly not literature is pregnant with a lot of evidence that wild meat has never really left the the, the kitchen it has always remained with us no matter what we have done or tried to do in terms of legislative uh, provisions or in terms of moral or in terms of uh, conservation uh, contestations, wild meat has remained part of the kitchen. It has remained part of our dishes throughout the African continent. And largely we have seen that it has been harvested legally to the extent that now uh, at a global level, if you look at the CPT uh, 14, they ended up uh, coming up with an agreement that it is best to utilize the wild meat rather than to ban or stop its utilization by looking at different alternatives for, 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 for protein. So wild meat has always been part of us. It is part of the tradition and it continues to, to, to form uh, a critical part of our food systems, which the demand is growing. So this is the reason why we are so focused or interested in talking about the wild meat. Why should we talk about it? Why should we talk about it being in the kitchen? And also we'll learn more as we discuss uh, uh, in this uh, uh, platform about how can it be utilized as a tool to achieve uh, sustainability or to achieve conservation outcomes. So, um, one of the reasons why wild meat seems to continue to gain attraction in terms of demand, one of the reasons is because of the growing population. As we are aware that the population has been growing since the 1700s or since the beginning of time, with an estimation that in the next uh, few years, uh, about uh, 20 or so years, we'll be approach, uh, 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 approaching 10 billion, which means there will be more food demand or more need for food in the in the 
there'll be there'll be more need for food by 2050 so this will need even will mean even high demand for protein and also in those communities that rely on uh, wild meat it is difficult for some of them even to find alternatives or to find alternative sources of protein it could be from plants or it could be from other animals for example you find that uh, the land or the landscapes where these communities are find it difficult for for them to keep uh, cattle or to keep goats or to even keep sheep. So they continue to depend and uh, rely on wild meat as their source of uh, uh, protein and also for micronutrients. So even if uh, alternative sources such as importation of goods or importation of of meat products also do not satisfy the market, particularly rural markets, where you find that uh, people have low uh, income and they cannot afford these expensive imported uh, meat products as their source of alternative um, of alternative protein. And also, currently, people are continuously demanding more nutritious and more healthy uh, foods. And wild meat presents this wonderful option of having uh, a micronutrient and also being organic for the fact that it is harvested from the wild. So majority of its uh, characteristics are that of organic farming as well. So uh, this has seen an increase in the demand or the need for wild meat, both in the rural and, and, and also in the urban uh, spaces with people demanding more and more of uh, this delicacy. So um, looking at the outlook of the global food demands, uh, it is expected that because of the population growth that I talked about earlier, we ex it is expected that about 60 to 100% of increase of food demand will also, will also accompany the population demand that, I mean, the population growth that we've talked about, that is expected expected to reach about 10 billion by 2050. So we're expecting that the current food demands now are going to increase by between 60 to 100%. And this uh, equates to, for example, the bill that was uh, measured in 2021, that is about 1.7 trillion, uh, which was up from 1.5 trillion in 2020. So this shows us that there's a growing trend of the food demand or the food uh, import bill. So most countries, particularly the poorest countries, which are in the sub-Saharan Africa, are importing more and more uh, food into, into their different countries or regions to satisfy this hunger need, which part of it is not, is this called uh, the secret hunger or micronutrients that is talked about or that is uh, quenched or satisfied by the wild meat. So if you uh, check also the 2017 statistics, in 2017, Africa spent about 64 billion on food imports. And this is estimated that in the next two years, which is 2025, we expect that this will almost double to 110 billion uh, US dollars, uh, the import of food. This further uh, indicate how much food is needed in the African continent uh, and how much is needed to satisfy or how many people are going to enter into uh, uh, enter into the hunger phase or who are going to be deprived of nutri adequate nutrition and adequate food in the next few years because of the growing population and also the scarcity of food. So it is with these projections, it indicates to us that if we diversify and include other different products such as wild meat, it could be an answer or solution that could be utilized to quench or satisfy the other part that is missing in terms of food shortages in Africa. So incorporating the wild meat into the food systems in Africa could be an answer that could reduce the demand for importation of, the, uh, of food and also to help generate uh, livelihoods at a local level. So in this study, what we did with this information, uh, learning of the importance of wild meat and why the world or why globally there is a focus on the need to uh, look into the wild meat and how it can be used sustainably. This study looked into the data 
uh, that is uh, that has been recorded in in Africa uh, between 2000 to 2023 until the time of this presentation, of course. And as if there are other if there's other information that just came out uh, recently, but. Uh, so this is what we focused on. We looked at the patterns in the wild meat consumption. How uh, how is the wild meat consumed and where, by whom, for what reason, right? We also looked at the typical types of African ungulate wild meat species. Uh, you'll find that here in this that we biasly focused on ungulates or hooven animals uh, as opposed to other types of wild meat such as reptiles and so forth. So we focus particularly on ungulates. These are plain game animals, in other words, uh, yeah, the common name, some they refer to it as plain game. And we also look at uh, we also looked at the illegal versus the illegal value chains. How do they look like? What are the differences? What are the opportunities for uh, scaling and formalizing these value chains? for sustainable wild meat sector. And also we propose at the end, the pathways on how wild meat uh, value chains or wild meat uh, sector could be formalized and also sustained. So these are the results of uh, this uh, study that was done. So the results show us that majority of the wild meat sector is largely legal. There are many instances around the continent where a uh, meat is harvested legally uh, it could be uh, a product of hunting for example uh, people who hunt for uh, for trophy hunting they hunt the meat and then the the carcass is either donated to the villages or to communities or it's uh, dressed and also uh, sold into the uh, tourist market so you find that majority of the wild meat sector throughout the continent is illegal. Uh, for example, I can give an example. In South Africa, in their recent uh, wild meat strategy, they indicate that 10% uh, is only formal, meaning 90% of their meat or wild meat is used informally, also including illegal. So people are harvesting and extracting the meat or from this, from the private reserves, communal lands, and also from protected areas. Uh, illegally. This is the case, even if you look at uh, Algeria, you look at Benin, you look at Rwanda, the, the situation is very similar. Majority of the meat is extracted uh, illegally. This is even despite the fact that in some countries, there are quota systems where, country, where people are allowed to apply, especially those that own uh, private ranches or own ranches. They're allowed to apply and be given a certain number of op of text or number of animal species which they can extract. But the largest meat that is consumed is uh, illegal, meaning the legal value or the legal meat or the legal value chains are only supplying a very small uh, portion. So uh, this is what we also learned from data uh, is throughout Africa from the West, uh, from the North, or even to the eastern parts of Africa. These are just some of the examples that I was giving there. So the meat is harvested mainly for subsistence, people harvesting for their own consume, consumption or for using with their families. Uh, also, meat is also harvested. Like, interestingly, for both illegal and also uh, legal value chains, it's also harvested for commercial purposes. Uh, illegal hunters who go into the protected areas or even to private range just to illegally extract or to legally harvest, they still come back and sell to different communities and different members or even distribute further. I will talk more about that when I uh, touch on the value chains on how the uh, meat flows into the uh, different uh, parts of the markets or different parts of of the consumers. And also meat is hunted uh, for recreational purposes, but this is generally uh, for touristic purposes or trophy. Uh, people who come from mainly from outside the country, of course, in South Africa and the other countries with uh, a bit of advanced uh, wild meat sector or the uh, trophy hunting sector, they tend to have uh, a strong uh, footprint of the recreational hunting. So these are some of the 
uh, hunting uh, reasons that uh, people hunt for, subsistence, commercial, and uh, recreational um, uh, hunting. So, so uh, as I indicated earlier that uh, the focus here is not on all types of species. One of the reasons is because of the focus, I mean, one of the reasons why we focus on ungulates is because of their genetic superiority in terms of productivity and also adaptation to the environment, and as well as the fact that they are non-threatened. So here we're referring to animals such as your kudus, impalas, and uh, other different types of antelopes that you can find out of the continent. So the data was collected particularly for, for those uh, studies or for that data that focused only on ungulate species. So you see, this is the profile of different uh, um, species that are consumed throughout the continent. So you see the we have the Southern, Eastern, Western, Central, and the North African uh, region. So you, uh, if you check, uh, Southern Africa, according to the data, has the most species that are consumed that are ungulates. These include your impalas, your your your, your springbok, your giraffe, inyala, bushbok, and uh, in terms of totality, in the recorded data, of course there could be more. About twenty-seven species were found to be. Uh, consumed or utilized as wild meat in the southern African region, but if you go to um, if you go to uh, 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 North Africa, the case is also different. We have uh, over eleven different type of species that have been recorded to be consumed or utilized by uh, diff uh, by those communities in North Africa. You, the common one in North Africa is the gazelle. There are different types of gazelle, such as the docas and the dama gazelle. So you'll find the different types of gazelles. That Those are the ones that are very common in countries like Algeria, uh, countries like um, uh, Egypt, you'll find those uh, in the North African region. Uh, and then also, if in, in the Eastern Africa, also they have gazelles, but also they have got the presence of jukas, uh, different types of jukas. You can talk of Maxwell juka, you can talk of Abbott juka, you can talk of many other different types. I think there are more than 12 different types of jukas that you can find in these different, uh, different regions, which are also found um, in, in the Western Africa. So it, by the general outlook of this um, map or, or this profiling, you will find you will see that Southern Africa presents the most species consumed, followed by um, West and Central Africa. So all the, these three regions in Africa seems to be the ones that consume the most type of of species or have the most type of species that are consumed. So these are, are, are different per region, but there are some that are common that you will find even from the west to the north to the east. For example, the wathok is a very popular animal that you will find that is consumed almost everywhere. But what is even common throughout the continent is the uh, is, is that almost all these animals are antelopes. So they are commonly uh, uh, it's typical small ruminants, which are more resistant to, uh, to, to the environment. We'll talk more about that when we get to the other parts of the results. So this is the outline of um, the legal, uh, legal and illegal value chains. So we looked at how the wild meat is flows from the source to the consumer. So uh, literature is. Uh, having two both situations of the legal value chains and also illegal value chains. So all of them, they seem to have their sources, which is as expected from protected areas and private ranches and uh, communal lands. Yes, it's, it's legal on the side where uh, they, are, uh, uh, al they are allowing uh, regulations to do that, but the illegal wild meat sector or the illegal value chains, they go into the very same sources or same places and steal or illegally hunt these animals. So uh, I'll focus more on the illegal ones and then just oppose that with the illegal with legal value chains. So uh, in terms of harvesting, uh, legal value chains, predominantly we see men being the uh, most 
uh, common hunters. Um, and uh, sometimes there are uh, groups of hunter porters. Hunter porters are a group of hunters which are organized by a lead hunter who will identify few individuals who can do hunting for him. Then he sends them into the bush to go and harvest for him. And then he, he, he collects the carcass and then processes it and then sells it further. So the, the, that's the typical situation that you find with illegal value chains. Um, and in terms of their hunting, they seem to be very non-discriminate. They can hunt any animal as long as they find any specific animal in the bush and it's the animal that is on demand in the market, they slaughter it. No care for age, no care uh, whether it's pregnant or so forth. So there is no care for, for anything. They rather, they just harvest the animal as they see it and it's also demanded. So they use different types of techniques, which are, uh, 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 which include snares, guns, spears, dogs, and uh, wires, different types of uh, trappings that uh, uh, hunters use when they go into the bush. And this is totally different from the formalized system. The formalized systems, they normally hunt at night, they blind the animal, they use the single bullet and it has to be a single uh, head bullet. Um, and also you, you find that uh, species are selected according to the size, according to whether they are pregnant and normally hunting occurs during winter. But there are situations where um, uh, some ranges that you find where they can uh, allow for hunting at any time, but on request, that is. Uh, those are private ranges that allow to do that. And then in terms of processing, illegal value chains, they tend to process more. Uh, they tend to process they tend to process their carcass in the bush. So the aperture that they have is in the bush. Uh, when a illegal hunter takes the meat from the protected area or private range, he takes it into the bush, he cleans it, removes the head, removes the, the intestines, the offals and so forth, and then uh, carries the rest of the meat to the to, to, to the communities or to where the uh, the market is for selling. So this is totally different, of course, with the legal meat or the legal value chains where there are private apertures or even on farm apertures where the farmer follow the procedures which are similar to the uh, to the red meat industry of cattle. For example, there are similar there are strict rules on how you handle the meat, food handling procedures, um, the heat that you're supposed to maintain and so forth and other storage uh, uh, requirements that are there. So, uh, but also we see that the products or the uh, the out the outputs from these processings uh, differ a bit. Uh, in the illegal meat, they tend, uh, in the illegal value chains, they tend to sell the whole carcass. It's a preferred sell, or if it's not a, a whole carcass, specific parts of the animal as animal are sold. It could be the head, it could be the could be the leg, it could be uh, ribs and so forth. So these parts are sold in that way. Uh, and then in the legal value chains, the situation is almost similar to uh, to the red meat uh, cattle industry. But there are no really standardized cuts. For that that you will find in also in the wild meat, it, although some butcheries or some uh, apertures in the wild meat sector have started to try to formalize or standardize cuts, but they are not generally acceptable uh, cuts or standardized cuts to say this is a a, a loin, this is a, uh, this is a rib, this is. A, uh, all these different types of cars that you'll find with the cattle or with the, uh, the the livestock that we have today. So these are the differences that you note. And then in terms of distribution, the similarities exist in both cases, only that some are doing it informally or illegal, others are doing it legally. Uh, we have also market traders. A hunter will go into the bush, for example, in the illegal value chains, bring the carcass or different uh, types of animal species, and then dish it or give it to different uh, wholesalers who are mainly women who will uh, take this meat and sell it further to different markets, either in urban areas or in the villages as well. So 
the system is generally the same with the legal value chains, but the difference is that the other ones are operating illegal or informal as opposed to uh, the legal value chains where they sell uh, on the farm or where they sell through their wholesalers. They distribute the meat to the wholesalers or they also distribute the meat to, to butcheries for further processing and also uh, making of other different products. So I wanted also to talk about, the, when I was talking about the products, I wanted to highlight to you that one of the interesting cuts or one of the interesting product of the wild meat is the biltong, which is very popular in South Africa. But uh, if you observe it, it's a very old African tradition of drying meat. So rather meat uh, is preferred to be consumed when it's dry and is usually salted. But uh, now the same process of, the, of, of drying uh, is now being accredited to the Africana community. One of the reasons is because they've revolutionized uh, 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 the process by bringing in different spices and different methodologies of drying and uh, giving it more value. And it's uh, one of the most valuable um, as uh, uh, products in the in the wild meat uh, 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 sector. So these are some of the uh, practices, particularly if we try to look into the old practices, there are some of the things that we can learn from. Some of them are still even reflected in the in the in the illegal value chains. For example, the smoked meat, how can we uh, formalize it? So these are some of the opportunities that we'll talk about when we talk about uh, the formalization of the value chains. So um, the legal value chains, this is very important. They seem to supply the rural communities, even though they have now reached the urban and also diaspora markets. For example, you find that they go all the way to EU or European Union, supplying African diasporas who have moved there and they still uh, want to consume and benefit or even enjoy this uh, the, the wild meat, but they cannot get it formal or official. So they tend to uh, smuggle it via airports and so forth. So the illegal value chain still seems to reach rural, urban, and even diaspora markets, which is very interesting. But typically, uh, it uh, this value chain seems to fo focus more on low income and middle income consumers. And then the legal meat, on the other hand, uh, is more focused on exports and also high income consumers. So it, it tends to reach mainly the uh, urban elites and also uh, urban, uh, those high class restaurants. That's where you will commonly find it, and other distributors that are located in the uh, in the urban centers. So this then leads us to talk about uh, the current status of the value chains or the current status of the wild meat consumption. Um, if you look at the track, if you track the value chains for both legal meat and legally supplied meat and also illegally supplied meat, you will realize that a majority of the wild meat is consumed by uh, rural communities and it's also uh, classified as illegal wild meat. So this tells us that there is an exclusion of, of, of local communities in the sale of wild meat. This is surprising and interesting because um, in as much when we are trying to deal with the, uh, uh, the population decline of these wild meat species and also fighting illegal hunting, there is a focus that let's reduce the demand. But then the legally supplied meat seems to be uh, only distributed to uh, high income consumers in the exclusion of the local communities that are even the highest consumers of this particular meat that we're talking about. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, 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 finding that we need to look into when we talk about how to sustain and also scale wild meat and also reduce the demand for illegally have a legally hunted meat. So there is unfortunately a high level of inadequacy in terms of information. Uh, all countries seem to struggle to produce adequate information, unlike, of course, uh, Southern African countries seems to have better data, but in particular, South Africa, with its uh, a, a more developed wild meat sector. So 
there is still, even with the best developed world mid sector South Africa, still doesn't have the enough numbers in terms of the adequate data, in terms of size of the population, population census of the wild meat species, the scale of the industry itself, and how big is the industry. Uh, that information is still not known. And information is collected from individual ranches that uh, information is also fragmented. There is no uh, scientifically collected information to make conclusions of the size of the industry, the number of species that exist, for us to really build a case for proper uh, sustainable wild meat sector. So there is a gap for us to look into that, uh, or there's a need for researchers and scholars and also even government and policymakers to look into that. So uh, those are some of the things that uh, we, 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 we see in the data. So also, interestingly, all studies that have been done tend to focus primarily on the uh, tend to focus primarily on the trade uh, reducing the ecological impact of illegal hunting they seem to focus mainly on the uh, processes or the channels for for trading meat but there is very very less that has been done in looking at the proper value chain analysis looking at the actual cost created per animal, actual cost that is made in each and every process. And these are important factors because they are, they are needed or required by at a micro level by companies to understand the nitty gritties or what is happening in the industry in terms of uh, the value creation, uh, specific activities at a farm, at a firm level or at a company level. But in this case, at a, at a, at a, at a producer level or at a distributor level. So there is limited information when it comes to that. So that's the problem or that's that's the main challenge that is experienced in the wild meat sector in terms of finding uh, uh, systems, I mean, coming up with systems for scaling. So by looking at all this metric or looking at the problems associated with scaling and sustaining the wild meat sector, uh, we came up with... Uh, a model, or should I say a framework that could be used or perhaps that proposes steps or pathways that could be followed in terms of formalizing and also achieving the um, uh, achieving a sustainable wild meat uh, value chain. So it's divided into three categories. That is looking at the legal value chains first and also looking at the legal value chains themselves and also looking at the uh, scaled legal value chains. That is it's a growth process from illegal, that is small operations to legalized and then to the bigger and uh, uh, scaled value chain. So uh, so in terms of the first process, that is the admission, when we want to transform and formalize the wild meat value chains or wild meat sector, it is important for us to first admit that majority of it is operating illegally uh, and majority of it is uh, I mean, the legal value chains are also servicing the uh, market that is not serviced by the legal uh, meat. For example, the rural communities and some parts of the, the, the urban communities do not have access to legal meat. So if we agree that this is our starting point to formalizing and understanding the formalities or the requirements for formalizing the value chains, it's important to discuss or invite different actors that are involved in the value chains, both illegal and illegal. Because here, as earlier identified, we talk about, we talk about uh, the exclusion of local communities. So if we can get these uh, people who are the largest consumer or the recipient of the illegal meat into the discussion table, and look for opportunities, how to co-opt them. For example, looking at artisanal uh, hunters or looking at training these uh, illegal, of course, some will say, uh, uh, why are you converting illegal hunters into legal ones? But we can also look at, at a generic perspective, looking at the communities, those that have interest in hunting 
or in interest in in uh, uh, in extracting meat. So those are some of the people that could be considered to scale or to formalize or to introduce them as uh, as artisanal uh, uh, producers or as artisanal hunters that could be cooperated or co-opted into uh, the protected areas or even uh, the uh, private ranches. That is, if there's an agreement that is reached. So also there's a need to study both the formal and the informal systems and create a transitional steps in between. That is, you have a semi-formal system and a three-quarter system before you reach the, 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 the legalized or the formalized system. So if you take these uh, actors or enterprises that exist in the illegal value chains or informal value chains and put them through this process of semi formality, three-quarter formality, and then all the way to full formality, then that could be a step which could be uh, beneficial into the scaling or building the sustainable or, or wild meat value chains. This will also talk of, of course, in terms of building skills and so forth at an individual level. So once we have the uh, legal value chains, what is important is to increase the intermediaries. For example, people who operate the apertures, support services around that. Uh, people who operate wholesalers, butcheries, uh, distributors, processors of different uh, products of wild meat, such as the biltong and different cuts that you can talk about, sausages and so forth, need also to be co-opted and also be brought in in the second level of legalizing and scaling the value chain. So those are the most important things to look into and also looking into the standards, traceability of the meat, uh, tr uh, uh, transparency, where is it harvested, who is harvesting it, what type of animal is it, how does it get to the consumer? All those are some of the uh, questions that we have to ask ourselves. But then uh, once the wild meat is scaling, what are the problems that are associated with this? How can we manage this? How can we then bring a sustainability? Because there's a potential that the moment we start to focus on consumption of wild meat, there's a uh, potential of over-exploitation. Then in this model, we advocate for intermediate value chains. Intermediate value chains, that is looking at small value chains and looking at large value chains, and then always uh, trying to bring in the immediate value chains, that is not allowing too much scaling because too much scaling poses also an environmental risk that is over-exploitation and perhaps failure to meet the demand, which will also, of course, speak to how, uh, uh, how the supply is also dealt with. So this is the model that looks into that uh, in terms of uh, distribution. So these are some of the likely outcomes. That is, if we uh, take a deliberate step into formalizing the value chains or into building a sustainable value chains in the wild meat sector, there's an opportunity for us to look into the communities from a different perspective. That is, uh, there are options for previously included households to be built in or to be brought in into the biodiversity economy. Uh, as we know that the industry is very, um, uh, uh, in terms of its one-sided, in terms of uh, racial design and also in terms of income level. So this is an opportunity for us to look into rural communities, the rural lands, communal lands, and repurpose it and also include uh, those previously excluded communities. It could also bring more sources of food. It could be also a power uh, to the household to control what they eat. And for example, in the case of South Africa, Zimbabwe, and other countries that have embarked on land reform programs, these are some of the options that they could consider rather than to uh, entirely focused on crop production or, or livestock production. And uh, there is an opportunity also for uh, these uh, people who are, I mean, the communities to be involved in, um, in, in wildlife or wild meat ranching. That is, so uh, the wild meat. If we focus on it, it presents us also with a huge potential for sustaining and also building rural economies. Of course, given the fact that it is a delicacy and uh, 
it demands because it's organic and it tends to demand a higher uh, prices. Uh, if we, especially if we look at the global market, there are huge there's a huge potential for exports. Unfortunately for South Africa, uh, it was banned from exporting uh, its uh, uh, ungulate species or hoofed animals because of uh, foot and mouth. But in general, there's a huge market or there's a big market to export. Uh, I just gave an example here for global export for deer, which was uh, amounted to 500 and 583 million global, that is, which is about 11.6 billion rands. That was the statistics for 2022. And uh, New Zealand being the top exporter, uh, selling to USA, China, and, and, and Germany. So this tells us that if only a deer, if only a deer could make so much and coming from uh, the European, I mean, from Australia and also from uh, EU as exporters of deer, uh, how many deer brothers does Africa have? Uh, Africa has got a huge uh, diversity in terms of species. You can talk of kudus, impalas, inyalas, wild beasts, zebras, and so forth. How much potential does that have uh, if we unleash and open up that economy? And also, uh, in comparison to livestock, uh, if you keep uh, a game, one animal, uh, I mean, sorry, game meat, in terms of average per hectare, it gives you up to 220 rands per hectare. In comparison to a livestock, it gives you up to 80 rands per hectare. So this is superior productivity in terms of economic uh, returns. And also in terms of job creation, it creates three times uh, more jobs than livestock farms, of course, because of uh, labor intensive. It's a labor intensive sector. So therefore it, it commands or it demands uh, more uh, people, I mean, more people to be employed in the sector. Um, and these are some of the reasons why wild meat is of focus. It's because it's healthier. It has got higher minerals and protein, low fat content, lower uh, percentage of inflammatory uh, uh, components. It is such as omega-6. It's lean. It's got omega-3, which is very good. It's an anti-inflammatory uh, 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 component that you find is organic. And it has got important acid, I mean, important acid for muscle growth. So if we look at these benefits associated with wild meat uh, and look at the statistics that we have, we have over 1.9 billion that are overweight. We will certainly demand or require these healthier products with children of over 41 million children under the ages of five or five who are obese. 140, 159 million worldwide are stunted uh, because, so if, if we bring in the wild meat into the kitchen, or if we bring in the wild meat into uh, food systems, we have this opportunity to uh, benefit or to, 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 to give people different nutritional values. For example, in some communities, especially in the central uh, in central africa such as congo yeah, wild meat is the only source of protein that people have particularly in the rural communities so it remains a very important uh, uh, an important uh, product there okay so now looking at the different statistics here um in terms of land degradation we see that over about 3.2 billion people or over 40% of people are adversely affected by land degradation. That is, they cannot produce enough. They cannot uh, have enough, uh, I mean, uh, uh, space for producing of their cropland and so forth. So 25% of global greenhouse emissions are coming from land clearance. Uh, and that is for us to find alternative food, alternative protein and so forth. We need to clear more lands and more lands so that we can grow your beans, your spinach and other micronutrients that you will find easily from the wild meat. Uh, also, uh, another statistics by UNEP shows that over 70% of the uh, projected loss of ter ter terrestrial biodiversity is because of agricultural expansions. So should we go agriculture 
in terms of livestock and crops, or should we call livestock? Uh, there is no right answer to it, but a combination will work uh, wonders. So here, what is clear is that agricultural expansion is a problem in terms of land degradation. It means if we continue to strive for more uh for, 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 for more agricultural product and in order to accommodate uh, our food needs. So this uh this gives gives us a, a discussion then to look into uh wild meat. Why should wild meat be thought of as a better alternative for conserving environment and also even protecting the clearance of the land? One, wild meat production or wild meat animal species, particularly the ones that are focused of this study, which is the ungulates, which are small ruminants, your impalas and kudus and the springbacks. They, they have less impact on the environment. They tend to require less water compared to other species, such as your cattle. They have got lower nutritional requirements and they tend to grow faster uh, 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 compared to your livestock. And this then this then speaks to how efficient are they in terms of using vegetation. So they are efficient in terms of using vegetation and giving them a more superior uh, outlook than the, the, the livestock in terms of uh, survive, surviving and adapting to climate change. And uh, they are also resistant to many diseases and parasites, and they use less antibiotics and also medicine. And even if there is bush encroachment, they are far less uh, affected by that as opposed to, uh, uh, to, to livestock, which will require you to clear more land so that they can live or survive well. Okay, so, so in other words, why is the wild meat a choice? It gives us an opportunity to start caring about the habitants. If we start to focus on consumption of wild meat and allowing private ownership or allowing people to control and own and, uh, uh, and sell wild meat species, it means the farmer or the ranchers in this case will start to take care of uh, take care of the habitants where these animals live, uh, which is the bush. So when you take care of the bush, it gives birth to uh, other, uh, 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 it gives birth to rewilding, that is bringing in back more vegetation, different types of species. You can talk of insects, we can talk of reptiles, we can talk of uh, any other, uh, many other types of vegetation that come about if We've, if our focus is on wild meat production. So wild meat becomes an op option for increasing biodiversity and also increasing um, uh, 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 vegetative, I mean, vegetation growth. And uh, because it uses less uh, chemicals, they, it means then there's less production of greenhouse gases. So what does this then mean in terms of policies? Uh, there are different types of supporting policy standards that exist. Uh, the voluntary guidance for sustainable uh, wild meat sector, which was put in 2018 by the CPT COP14, it looks at how can wild meat be sustainably utilized and be harvested uh, to support both nutritional needs and also to income of rural and also even other actors that have interest. So you will find that because of all this, uh, uh, conflicting signs, some saying wild meat consumption reduces populations or causes extinction. Uh, others say, no, it could be used and utilized sustainably. Therefore, we need to find ways. Until, there's a, there, was, until there was an agreement that it is best that a sustainable wild meat sector is developed because of the problems associated with banning or restricting consumption of wild meat, which has failed over many, many years until to date. So some countries have tried to come up with legislative uh, provisions in order to support that. We can look at uh, game, uh, game meat uh, essay strategy, which was uh, recently gazetted. It looks at how it can build the sector and also open up spaces for 
private community, I mean, for communities to own land and also produce wild meat, focused primarily on wild meat production and also to work with already existing um, uh, ranches. And also the Zimbabwe Biodiversity Economy Report, that is the one that they are working on trying to build the biodiversity economy. So they are looking into how to bring in wild meat as a sector that really needs to uh, be developed and its value chains be brought into uh, into the mainstream economy as well. So you will find uh, that even at the SATIC level, for example, there's a SATIC wildlife-based economy strategy that looks at how to develop the whole biodiversity economy in the SATIC uh, region. It also does not only look at uh, uh, tourism and other wildlife type of industries, but it also focuses on how the wild meat could be a niche that Africans or particularly the region could focus on. So you'll find different uh, regimes and combination of legislative environment that exist in different parts of, 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 of the world. And another typical example is Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania also in 2020 introduced uh, uh, and allowed the consumption of wild meat as a way to stop uh, illegal hunting and also to support uh, the agricultural sector. So I'm um, now coming to the end of this uh, conversation. Uh, I'll now open up for, for chats. So these are some of the things that are left in the sector that needs to be uh, looked into. That is, the sector remains uh, very untransformed and it needs to be looked into in terms of research, in terms of um, policies, in terms of operational uh, processes and also traceability and also transparency. And uh, yeah, and also we need to look into the extent uh, and also the value of the sector. Uh, as it is now, we don't really have actual data in the in in the wild meat sector that guarantees us how much is the value per animal and how much can really be made from a sector. How much enterprises that come in can make and generate from the sector. Uh, the information that exists is just all over the place and it depends also on the farmer. And also this is complicated by the fact that uh, the income that comes from wild meat does not only come from meat itself, but it also comes from uh, other related uh, income such as tourism uh, or photographic uh, uh, related activities. So we need to develop uh, the sector, different products, of course, we can talk of sausages, biltongs, and different cuts, and policies also need to be looked into. And uh, very importantly, which species are more superior and are more uh, opposed to uh, survive in this climate, uh, uh, I mean, in this environment that is pressed by climatic uh, uh, change issues or climatic change uh, concerns, which animals have got genetic superiority? Uh, which ones can be more reproductive um, faster than the others so that they can supply the demand. So um, this is uh, the end of my discussion. I'll be willing to chat more and also to discuss further. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wiseman. Um, we come to the end of the formal presentation part of our evening. And to open the next part of the evening, I would like to read a quote from Chris in the chat. The bushmeat crisis in Africa is a critical conservation challenge that requires a nuanced approach, balancing wildlife conservation with the socioeconomic needs of local populations enforcement of hunting regulations, public education, and providing sustainable livelihood alternatives are key components of a potential solution. Um, so Wiseman, I echo the words of Chris, and we would like to thank you for this uh, presentation that really set the context of this industry in Africa and how the industry itself can be a tool for, for a productive, sustainable livelihoods or towards um, destruction of uh, habitats and, and uh, animal populations. So 
Um, we look forward to the Q&A. Wiseman, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And it's lovely to have you with us this evening. So we now go into the uh, Q&A part of our presentation tonight. So um, you're welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen, or you can raise your hand or you can write a question in the chat. Um, you're welcome to start, start with questions. I also see uh, Emlyn's um, comment in the chat. Um, all the scholars in in the in the community tonight, please feel welcome to reach out to Emlyn and um, access the paper that he made available there. I did see Prof. Any young um, in earlier as well, um, and he also really um, presented to us earlier, I know that was actually last year, on the dangers of the bushmeat sector in Nigeria. So um, also good to see him. I see Prof. Liesel from us. Um, so hand this up. Um, Liesel, please ask your question. Good evening, um, everybody in Weissman. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I first want to ask wow. Marie, we need to backtrack. There was a presentation, I think it was in 2022 sometimes, where we also talked about the bushmeat, and i sorry, but I can't remember the speaker's name, where he focused on Central Africa and the importance, and Weissman referred to it, the importance of, of the bushmeat with the people in, in Central um, Africa. And then I think we also must not forget, and that's I always tell the students, if you're a vegetarian, you're sort of reversing evolution because we need to eat meat. So I can understand the importance of it, and we definitely need to start thinking differently of eating meat. Um, and um, uh, this is now, and the question is, and, uh, and I know that the, the program focus and the, the stuff that they're doing in Stellenbosch is on, on the angulates is, but um, are there anybody that looks into the uses of abalone and crayfish from the marine environment? Because th those numbers are also depleted to an uh, astonishing numbers. So we, we're focusing on the angulates because we see them in the land and, and, and the, the wild, the African wild trade. But what about um, animals in the sea? Johan, oh. should I respond? Please, please go for it. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I always uh, have a bit of a chat with uh, my uh, vegetarian friends. We always ask, I always ask them, why are you anti-nature? They say, no, we are promoting nature. But if you look at it, uh, they are talking about these alternative food needs, that is, uh, the requirement to satisfy the protein. It means, I always tell them that this means clearing more bush and clearing more land to put more cattle or, or to put more crops and beans and so forth. So the moment you do that, it means you have already started uh, not taking care or destroying the habitants for the bush or for, for the wild meat or wild meat species. So I say you are anti uh, uh a nature, but uh, I know that is a bit controversial, but yes, I agree. And this situation is the same uh, even with other um, uh, areas. Of course, here we focused on ungulates, but it's the same as you stated with in the in the in the blue in the blue waters that is in the ocean. You also find it with other different type of species like reptiles and so forth. Thank you, Mr. Perumal. You 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 were going to make a comment. Yes, uh, I, I'm talking about the, the, the bush meat. Uh, let us look at it at the bigger picture. If we if we talk about uh, people uh, buying the bush meat, etc., uh, we we need to look at it. Is it sustainable uh, to to the species? Won't the species get uh, get actually depleted in the process? Uh, Wiseman, would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the depletion of species is one of the greatest uh, uh, concerns. But uh, what uh, evidence shows is that the banning or restriction of consumption of meat, it has actually more detrimental effects on the, spe on the populations 
than the consumption itself. Uh, let me give an example. For example, there was a study done in Zimbabwe uh, by Lindsay over five years. I was tracking the meat that was harvested uh, 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 through snares by illegal hunters. So they recorded nearly 2.3 um, uh, animals that were caught using snares in the bush. And out of those 2.3, 58% of those uh, animals that were caught by those snares rot in the bush. They went into rot. That is, they were captured and the, the hunters never recovered them. So they rot in the bush. 20%, nearly 20% of them were recovered by uh, the uh, the ranch, I mean, the, the, the guards, uh, the rangers. And then only about 13% of it was extracted or taken by the Bushmen or by the illegal hunters. So if you look at this data, it tells us that there is nearly 90% wastage of meat in the bush because of illegal hunting. Meaning if this 13% that uh, people are, are, are benefiting from uh, harvesting, it gives an opportunity for us that if we provide more legal meat, then we will have an opportunity to address the demand for illegal demand. So this is the example I'm giving you so that we can see how wasteful is illegal wild meat. Because yes, we are finishing the, the populations, but banning has more detrimental effects on the animal populations than than not banning it. Yeah, because the reason why I'm asking ask, ask this question also is that uh, Tonga was was a guinea fowl country, but but now we don't see the guinea fowl anymore. It is it has also depleted. Yes. Yeah. So. So, so, so how how do we uh, ensure the, the sustainability of species in the long yes, term? Uh, okay, thank you very much again. Um, if uh, you look at the model that we are proposing there, we are also advocating for intermediate value chains. That is, in as much as we want to scale or uh, open up doors for legal meat consumption, we are also mindful that there is a potential of over-exploitation of species. Therefore, these value chains should not be allowed to grow beyond control, but there must be a, an intermediate management system. So in an intermediate value chain, what we do is we look at the smallest value chain, we look at the biggest value chain, and then we, 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 we develop a mechanism for always uh, converging into the medium value chain. So we are avoiding being too big because we are, are mindful of the species exploitation or ever exploitation. So those are some of the techniques that could be employed. But of course, the industry still lacks a lot of data. We still need to research more and experiment more uh, on how this sustain sustainable um, uh, utilization of wild meat species could be achieved. Whilst I'm agreeing with you, sir, but uh, then, uh, are we not really creating another market uh, in the industry uh, in the long term? We must look at Israel. Who is uh, are the game reserves actually going to be a benefit from, from this process, or is it, is it just the, uh, the the market in the outside going to benefit from the process? Okay, so. Um the value chain analysis shows us that the market is already there. The demand for wild meat is there and is ever increasing. And the majority of it is servicing the legal one, in this case, is servicing rural communities who are excluded from the formal systems. So, and uh, because they are employing all these unsustainable harvesting practices, and causing the losses that I've already indicated on earlier on. 
then this puts more pressure on the species. Even with the growing population and growing demand, it puts even more pressure, meaning in order to satisfy that demand for wild meat that exists already, there will be more pressure into tracking animals or I mean trapping animals and even trapping those that are non-target species, including endangered species. So it even causes more dangers to the uh to 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 to, to the populations than banning it. So that's why we advocate that it is best looking at evidence to promote this, the supply of legal meat and distribute it to those that need it the most. Because by not or removing it or banning it or restricting it, the result has shown that what is happening is the depletion and over-exploitation of species, including non-target species, threatened species are also lost in the process because of uh, banning and uh, restricting consumption of meat. No, no, we, we, we're not talking about also, we also look at, at uh, this culture of eating meat, um, uh, wild meat, right? Mm -hmm. While in one hand, uh, we, we, we will tend to agree what you're saying, but where, where did this culture come from all of a sudden that uh, they suddenly, uh, what I'll say, a demand for, for eating of wild meat? Because uh, if you look at uh, history, history tells us straight, uh, in any communities, you only hunted w when there was a need to, and you you, you ensured the sustainability of the species. Well, right. And if you look at all communities across the board, mm. they were all not carnivores. They were uh, more herbivores than carnivores. Mm -hmm. Um, the 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 first question I asked was that: Has the wild meat ever left the kitchen? I think that is the question that we must ask ourselves. Has the wild meat ever left the kitchen? The answer is no. It has never left the kitchen, but we have put restrictions around its use uh, because of concerns around the population decline, as you say. So we can now then look into the past practices or indigenous knowledge systems of how to consume and how to preserve or how to even ensure the continued existence of different species. For example, seasonality of saying uh, wild meat is hunted in winter. It is not a merely uh, uh, something that came from the blue. It's a traditional practice that we look into uh, saying, when was the meat in the past hunted? Meat was only hunted during um, a winter towards summer season because that's when people won't be busy or focusing on uh, on cultivation of land and so forth. So they tell, that's the time when they can do hunting. And also people are aware that after summer, uh, the animals start to reproduce and also recreate. And this gives them time to, uh, to, re to, 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 to reproduce and, uh, and, 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 and ensure that there is continued existence of these different species. So, uh, all these different methodologies that uh, were practiced in the past, we can still learn from them as a way or as a tool that we can build into our current value chain systems for sustainability. Uh, another thing that I was thinking of is um, uh, uh, how in the past uh, certain species were not consumed. For example, my surname is Nlovu, and Nlovu is an, is an elephant. So traditionally, you are given these surnames as a way to conserve. For example, I am love. I'm not allowed to eat and love animal. And there are so many African communities or people that are, have got different surnames for different animals, including Impala itself, that is the most consumed. So once you are named, uh, your surname is Impala you do not consume that speech. It's, it's, another it's another tradition. So I'm just trying to bring in different systems that were used in the past as a tool for conservation. But now we're also permanent uh, into, we're, we're, moving, we're, we're living in one area for a long time. Unlike in the past, when they see that the numbers are depleted, they start to move to another environment. Um, they have to move to another environment so that they allow the species to regenerate or reproduce in that particular area. But now we don't have that. So that's why we advocate for the intermediate value chain system 
that is managing demand and supply, because all this needs to be balanced so that we do not run a risk of over exploiting this species. Thank you. Yeah, but it's global. <laughs> But I'm going I'm going to ask if, if we can return to you in a little while. I just want to go to the questions in the chat as well. Uh, but you're welcome to stay on and we can come back to you again. Um, I just want to go to Petsu Mokatla's question. Uh, what sort of conversations are you having with the formal conservation sector um, in how the sector can play a role in supporting this process? So I think that's quite a, quite an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the conservation, the conversation that is there between wildlife economies and the, the conservation sector. Um, so let me answer this from a philosophical point of view of uh, the Institute and also the wildlife economies itself. So the focus is to say, how can we achieve conservation goals uh, using evidence or using the economy as a vehicle for, for, for accomplishing that? So we are saying, how do we harness economic opportunities around all these different ecological goods, be it medicine, plants, meat, and so forth, as a way in which we can manage or run the economy. And also using evidence. For example, in this case, uh, we presented or I presented evidence on how focusing on livestock leads to the destruction of the vegetation. And how, because there's been, in the conservation sector, for example, there's been advocacy on saying, let's encourage people to look for alternative sources of protein or alternative sources of food uh, and away from the wild meat. But that has not answered the question of how are we going to deal with the destruction of the forest? How are we going to deal with the uh, problems of de land degradation that are caused by uh, agricultural processes? How are we going to deal with the issues of uh, chemical production that is required to facilitate or to produce all these different uh, uh, agricultural products from crops to plants? So then we present uh, evidence based on uh, science on how wild meat could be a solution to uh, conservation and also a solution to uh, uh, livelihoods uh, needs. Thank you. Thank you, Wiseman. Um, just in a comment from Chris in the chat, while it is a great approach to consider wild meat as a potential solution to the much needed human nutrition, to, uh, we may also need to carefully look into the growth and maturity cycle of wild uh, spices, organic cycle, to meet the human population explosion. I, I think he meant to say wild species. Um, on another level, bushmeat brings more cultural heritage to rural communities in sub-Sahara. While promoting bushmeat, there will also be a need to find how to deal with zoonotic diseases, which has brought the banning of antelope meat and rumen supply because of the foot and mouth disease. Um, Wiseman, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I can never comment, but I, I agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Chris that uh, we still need to do more. There's a, a limited data and research in terms of uh, the, this, the sustainability of the wild meat uh, value chain. Uh, it talks also of other concerns that are raised critically in literature looking into the zoonosis or the diseases that are transferred from animals. And even the recent outbreaks, for example, if you look at COVID and Ebola, there are some of the concerns that have been raised when we talk about wild meat consumption. But uh, looking into the scientific uh, information, we are aware that uh, these uh, diseases do not only come from wild meat. Uh, in fact, there are more uh, diseases in the livestock or that are transferred from livestock to humans more than they are transferred from um, our wild meat. So you, evidence also shows us that 
wild meat is more resistant to many other diseases as compared to, 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 to cattle, for example. So that is also something uh, that we need to really bring to the fore and let uh, evidence lead or let science lead to really direct us on the right direction in terms of the extent of the disease infection that can move from animals to people and also in comparison between the two, uh, which is livestock and wild animals, which is which, which ones has more uh, diseases than the other and which ones are more likely to affect uh, humans' health more than the, the, the other. So that is important. And all those other concerns are very, very uh, critical uh, in terms of growing the species and also retaining cultural heritage. Because some people, of course, consume wild meat because of their culture. Uh, of course, taste and other things drive the demand, but culture is very, very important because some consume uh, entirely because it uh, is believed that maybe in their surname it gives them power or it also could be thought of as being a medicinal animal or it has got some medicinal effects. Whatever the reasons people consume the meat for, uh, it's irrelevant, but it connects them to their culture and also while it's supplying nutritional needs. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Wiseman. I'd just like to, I think Prof Inyang fell out earlier, so I just want to say welcome to him. It was great to have him with us again tonight. Uh, we did share the link to his talk earlier in the um, in, in the chat, so if you want to see the other side of the wild meat sector where things go completely wrong, um, Please go and view that talk. Prof. Inyang, I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Just say hello. Hello. I'm happy to be here. I greet everybody. I've listened carefully to what has been presented. And I am worried. I'm worried. I wish we could balance, you know, these kind of uh, recommendations with the reality on ground back here in Nigeria and in West, as some of the West African countries where the animals have already been eaten out in most places. You know, like the ungulates is talking about, they are almost non-existent in many places nowadays. We are even looking for ways to bring them from Southern Africa, you know, to repopulate some of our protected areas because we have exhausted them. So it's an interesting talk, and I would like, you know, to communicate with the presenter uh, to talk further and, you know, share experience. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thanks, Prof. Inyang. We will definitely connect you with Wiseman. That is not a problem, and the two of you can connect. And if, if you would like him to present to your um, class in Nigeria, we can, um, if he's willing, we can, we can see if we can make that happen. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Adam. Yeah. Um, the West African situation is a very interesting one. Uh, the depletion of animals is very huge, as you say, um, I, I like to give an example in comparison between the East African country, particularly Kenya, and also perhaps compare it with uh, South Africa. Since the 1970s, in the Kenya, in the Kenyan region, they've banned the use of consumption of wild meat, for example. Uh, but what we have observed from then to now is that Kenya has lost nearly 68% of its wildlife. Uh, this is statistics that is all over the place. And compare that almost a similar period with South Africa. South Africa around the 1960s allowed uh, or liberalized the ownership of wild animals and allowed private ranching and private ownership. Uh, the animals were nearly less than 600,000 uh, uh, around that time. And then as we speak today, South Africa is nearly uh, 20 million animal species, and uh, they have been promoting use since then. And then with, in, in contrast with Kenya, Kenya has lost close to 70% of its wildlife because people are poaching, people are harvesting illegal and using, and no one cares about the animals. 
why will a farmer see an impala running around his area and take care of it when he cannot generate money from it? Or uh, he would rather save the grass or even let it die so that he can uh, save the grass for the cattle or goats. So this is just a, an example for us to see that banning versus use, it has got a different effect. Yes, maybe in other regions, a different outcome could be experienced, unlike the one in South Africa. But what we see is that all countries where there is heavy restriction or complete ban, animal species are depleting at uh, mass as compared to those that have promoted use. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Wiseman. We've had Wiseman for an hour and a half. If there is a question, somebody with a burning question, I'm happy to let him take it. But otherwise, I think we, um, we're going to thank him and um, then see each other again next week, Thursday. Thank you very much. I think that then that is it for this evening. Thank you for, for being with us this evening. It's been a very interesting conversation. It's necessary questions that we need to ask and explore this and um, use this sector as a productive conservation tool, but also productive towards um, livelihoods. Thank you to Prof. Enyang joining us all the way from Nigeria and all of you, thank you very much. We'll see you again next week then.